Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out. This is a fantastic turnout. Um, you can talk well, louder. Oh, louder? Yes. Yeah. 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 We can yeah. shut up. You can't hear me? Everyone just needs to be quiet. Okay. Yes. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Just do, just do this if I fade out. Um, I was a little weird today, but hopefully it'll hold up. Uh, so, uh, thank you for coming out for our uh, community town hall. Sometimes when you organize these, you don't know if like five people are going to come out or a few hundred. So, um, I think it's great uh, when a lot of people come out. Uh, even when we have some disagreements, uh, it's a good thing. It's democracy in action. Um, so, I want to uh, say as I begin my uh, second year in the Senate, uh, I like to say this uh, a lot because I really believe it. I wanted to say what a deep honor it is uh, to represent our community uh, in the Senate, especially with everything uh, going on right now uh, in this country. And I know we have uh, uh, sometimes our, our California and San Francisco issues that we agree on or disagree on, but uh, you know the role that California is playing right now in terms of pushing back against some of the things coming out of Washington, whether it's around climate or immigration uh, or the LGBT <laughs> community, uh, or the you know access to health care, uh, California is playing a very unique role uh, at the moment, and uh, we always play a unique role, but it's especially unique now. Uh, and it is uh, I, I knew we were going to have to work on a lot of hard issues uh, when I was running for the Senate. Uh, I did not think that we were going to also have to uh, defend against like basic American values, like the fact that there should be a free media. Um, I, I thought that was settled in the past, but. Uh, apparently, we're going to have to fight uh, for things like that again. Um, last year was a very uh, productive year in the legislature. Uh, some things happened that uh, uh, the legislature and the governor had uh, struggled to make happen for years, and finally the logjam uh, broke. So we passed um, uh, SB1, which is the uh, largest uh, transportation infrastructure funding measure uh, in the history of California. $5.2 billion. Um, <laughs> go to, um, increasing everything from road resurfacing to starting to fix our uh, sort of dilapidated uh, state uh, highway system uh, to uh, 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 investing in public transportation. And some of us fought really hard to make sure that public transportation was well represented. It is about 20% of the package uh, goes uh, directly into transit. Uh, so it was, a, it was a big step forward. There are some people trying to undo it uh, at the ballot, and we'll have a debate as a state about do we want to fix our infrastructure. Uh, but that was a, you know, that has struggled for years, and we finally got it done last year. I'm really proud of that. Uh, we renewed and extended cap and trade, uh, which is California's uh, innovative approach to uh, reducing carbon emissions and climate change is a model uh, for the world. Uh, I was uh, uh, in City Hall right around the time that we renewed it, uh, which it had been a struggle for years. Uh, and the French Consul General came up to me and he said, I want to let you know uh, how significant it is internationally that California did this to show that, uh, that what our president uh, thinks about climate and fossil fuels is, does not reflect uh, what everyone in this country Things. And then we passed a, uh, a major housing package, and, and I know we'll talk about housing today, uh, but uh, a package uh, to uh, streamline approvals for housing, uh, to um, fund affordable housing, to make clear that uh, cities have the power to require inclusionary affordable housing percentages uh, for, uh, uh, for new development, uh, which have been in doubt, and so forth. So we got a big housing package on. Uh, another area which, which doesn't get as much attention uh, is that it was a big year for criminal justice reform uh, last year, particularly reforming uh, uh, our approach to drug sentencing, uh, getting rid of some drug sentencing enhancements because uh, drug is a, drugs are an it's addiction, it's a health issue, uh, it's not um, a criminal uh, issue. Uh, and we also eliminated life without parole uh, for juveniles. Uh, we are, we're off uh, to a, a great uh, start this year. I want to mention a few of the uh, bills that I'm working on, most of which we've announced already. We have some additional bills 
that we're going to announce. Um, I'll just sort of go through some of them with you. Uh, I'm going to leave housing to the end of my remarks. I'll talk about what we're doing this year, why we're doing that, them, why I think you should support them, um, and and we can have a, you know, I'm happy to take any feedback on that or anything else because housing is really important, but there are other important issues uh, as well. Um, so you may have seen that uh, at the beginning of the month, I introduced a bill um, to adopt uh, net neutrality uh, in California. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, what we've seen is, you know, I, I am, uh, I think I sit in the, in, in the middle of some of the generations in this room right now. I'm pushing 50, uh, and I remember when, you know, uh, when I didn't have email, didn't have, you know, the internet wasn't a thing. Well, the internet's a thing now, and it's not just a thing, it's the heart, <laughs> it's the heart of our democracy, it's at the heart of our economy, uh, and uh, it's really just so uh, just tragic what the FCC did, so we're going to protect it here in California, uh, and we are working that through the legislature. Um, la uh, I think last week, or the week before, uh, I introduced legislation to um, deal with auto break-ins, mm -hmm. which uh, you know, as well as I do, is... Uh, There is a loophole in the auto break-in uh, uh, penal code section that uh, technically, if you uh, um, smash a window in a car and steal stuff out of it, uh, that is not considered an auto burglary, uh, unless you also prove that the door was locked. And so, so if you have, for example, a rental car, which there are a lot of problems with rental cars being broken into, and the tourists are now in uh, Virginia, they've gone home to Virginia or China or, you know, uh, you know, Israel or wherever else they came from, uh, they're not going to be able to testify that the door was locked. Or uh, a burglar, all they have to do is unlock the door after they smash the window because they, they know what's going on, uh, and it makes it part of the proof. So this has been a recurring issue that was brought to our attention. Uh, so we're going to cl clarify, make really clear that, yeah, that if you smash a window to get into a car, uh, you don't have to prove the door was locked. That is, that is auto burglary. Um, uh, late last week, uh, or just late a couple days ago, uh, I announced an effort with a colleague of mine, Senator Henry Stern from Los Angeles, uh, working with um, the city and also with uh, Los Angeles County uh, around conservatorships, uh, which is uh, for chronically homeless people who are severely mentally ill, <coughs> severely drug addicted, and completely unable uh, to care for themselves and who are dying on our streets. And I think it's something that um, we, you know, and it's not just San Francisco. As much as we struggle uh, with chronic homelessness in San Francisco, and again, we're talking about a very tiny subset of the homeless population. Our homeless count is about 7,500 or so people. We're talking about, at the most, um, a few hundred people who are um, just incapable of caring for themselves. And we see people dying on our streets. We all see it periodically and wonder why this is being allowed to happen. Uh, and in LA, it's even bigger than this here bigger city and huge homeless population. Uh, and so uh, our Department of Public Health um, and our Homeless Services Agency, as well as the agencies in LA County, are saying that the current tools to, to conserve people who are, uh, who are incapable of caring for themselves and who are deteriorating and dying on the streets are inadequate, especially around drug addiction, because people are severely addicted, and then they can become sober temporarily, and, so they are, and then they go back in. And so we want to make sure that our conservatorship law uh, is uh, ample enough to <coughs> include this population. And in California, unlike some other states, we have some pretty stringent checks and balances on conservatorships. It is a significant step to conserve someone where the county basically uh, you know, makes decisions for them. Uh, you have to renew it every year. There's a judicial involvement every step of the way. They get counsel. Uh, we take that seriously because you're dealing with people's civil liberties. Uh, but uh, we want to give our counties uh, a better tool uh, to try to help save people's lives. Uh, I also, we haven't announced this yet, but in, 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 in very soon we're going to be announcing a bill uh, to try to deal with recycling theft, uh, not the individual people who are, you know, picking food, but we're talking about the organized crime rings that we see, um, where there are literally, these are like criminal operations, where it's not just, the, you know, we're not talking about the, you know, the, the low-income senior who's um, picking some cans or the homeless person picking some cans. It's not, it's about these organized crime rates. We want to try to break them up and have better tools to do that. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I announced uh, a major effort 
uh, to address youth, youth homelessness in California. Um, it is uh, until you, when you see the numbers on youth homelessness in California nationally, uh, it blows your mind that you haven't been involved in the issue before. Um, one out of 10 CSU students in California is homeless. Uh, in LA County Community College, 20% of the um, students are homeless. Uh, we have uh, the number of homeless people in Cal homeless young people, 24 and under, uh, going 13 to 24 in California, unaccompanied. I'm not talking about kids who are homeless with their parents, which is a, a tragedy as well, but at least they're with their parents. So we're talking about unaccompanied kids, 13 to 24, who are homeless. Uh, it's gone up by a third in the last two years. It's over 15,000 now, which is a conservative estimate. It's probably higher. Um, and the state, until about a year and a half ago, invested for youth-specific homeless services in, for the entire state of California, a whopping $1 million for the entire state of California. It's since increased to $10 million, which is better but not enough, uh, and it's very decentralized. The bill will centralize um, homeless youth services into one office, the Office of Homeless Youth, which will be nested in an existing agency. Uh, and we're going to increase the resources um, uh, by an additional, if the bill passes, uh, by uh, $60 million. And so we just want to try to have a much more robust effort. Because what ends up happening, in, you know, two thirds of California counties do not have youth specific homeless services. It's all the same. So you, and, and to take a, a 16 year old living on the streets and lump them in with a 45 year old who's been homeless for 20 years, uh, those are very different populations. Uh, they both need help, uh, but you can't just lump them together. Youth is a very, it's a very different uh, situation. Um, uh, a couple final bills. Um, I, I introduced last week uh, our the great supervisor from this district, my friend uh, Supervisor Katie Tang. Uh, was it? Uh, I guess the year before, the last year before, uh, passed uh, really first in the nation. Uh, lactation legislation for the workplace uh, to make you know, make sure that um, women who come back to work after giving birth are able to have private, um, you know, reasonable, dignified space to lactate at work, uh, so that a woman doesn't have to choose uh, between, you know, a woman can make her own choice about when to come back to work, and can come back if, they, and if she wants to come back. Uh, while she's still breastfeeding, that she can make that choice and that the choice isn't made for her. And we know that when women, uh, and this has to do with paid leave, family leave as well, uh, when women uh, are delayed in coming back to work, um, whether it's because they don't have to pay for leave or because uh, they want to lactate for their kid and there's nowhere to do it, they have to sit on the toilet to do it at work, um, that exacerbates pay inequity. It, it just, it, it really is harmful. And so we're going to take that uh, announced legislation to take Supervisor Tang's legislation statewide, and she was with us at the press conference announcing it. And so excited about that. Um, last year, and for reasons I don't know, the bill uh, died, and we're going to try it again to uh, expand on-site water recycling in California. Um, right now, um, you know, we, we are, looks like we might be tipping back into a drought. I think the majority of the state is now back in drought conditions. Uh, and we had this, you know, terrible drought a few years back, and, you know, the governor did some bold things about we trying to require reduced uh, water use and so forth in conservation, uh, but unfortunately we didn't use it as an opportunity to restructure water in California. We have a long-term structural water shortage in California. It's not just temporary drought, it's a long-term problem. Uh, and we have an ancient 18, you know, 19th century system, and in particular we do not recycle enough water, not nearly enough. And we, want, we need sort of utility scale water recycling, uh, but also we need to make it easier for people to put water recycling uh, particularly for non potable use in their homes, in their businesses. Uh, and the state has never set health and safety standards uh, for on-site water use. So for San Francisco, it's a, we have a program. We have the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. It's a huge agency. They establish their own standards and their own program. For the vast majority of cities, they don't have those tools. And they are, a lot of cities want to establish an on-site water recycling program. Uh, but they don't feel comfortable doing it because the state has never set standards. So we're going to require the state to set those standards so we can start seeing 
more of these uh, permit programs uh, around the state. Uh, so those are uh, not all the bills we're doing, but uh, a, a smattering of them. Um, and so, uh, you know, we uh, <coughs> have a good bill package uh, this year. Um, the other uh, bills uh, that I'm offering are three bills uh, relating to housing. Uh, and, um, you know, I think for anyone who's watched my uh, career uh, in, in San Francisco uh, on the Board of Supervisors um, will know that housing is uh, it's a big issue for me. I think it's a big issue for a lot of people. Even though homelessness recently leapfrogged, housing is the number one issue in the city. When you told people housing is still um, a close second. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, before I was in the Board of Supervisors, uh, you know, I was the president of my neighborhood association, involved in a neighborhood work in the Casco for a lot of years. And so I've, I've seen a lot of different things about how the process works, what doesn't work, uh, how, what are some of the limits when uh, you know, zoning uh, makes you build a smaller uh, building than people uh, might otherwise want to build. Um, and I, you know, fundamentally, even though the architecture of buildings and the, uh, the look and feel of a neighborhood are really important, I've lived in my neighborhood for 20 years, I care passionately about it, uh, it's also about the people uh, living uh, in a neighborhood. And what we're seeing now. This is not just like a San Francisco, Berkeley, Santa Monica issue, which I think some people have perceived it to be. There's like little pockets of bad housing situations around the state. This is like almost everywhere in California. Now, when I talk to my colleagues, you know, not, not just from West LA, but from the Inland Empire, from like Riverside, San Bernardino area, or from Fresno, or parts of the state that I think we've historically viewed to be the affordable areas, uh, those have gotten a lot more expensive. People are, you know, struggling there as well. Uh, the other thing that we have, uh, uh, and so last year, um, uh, as you know, and I'm sure there are some supporters and detractors in the room on the bill, I authored SB 35, um, which, uh, which passed and is now in effect. And what SB 35 does is we have something called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, RENA. Every eight years, every city in the state gets its number, market rate, uh, moderate, low income, very low income. This is how much you're supposed to produce in the next eight years. Um, and uh, there's never been any teeth in it. And so what the bill does, it says if you're if you're meeting your arena goals, Godspeed. If you're not meeting your arena goals, we're gonna help you do it by streamlining housing approvals uh, in your community. And streamlining mean that means that if someone proposes a project that's within zoning, uh, it has to be approved subject to design review. Uh, and uh, uh, it, the bill had a lot of a lot of debate about it um, in communities and the legislature. Uh, in the end, we got a broad coalition behind it of uh, environmental organizations, affordable housing organizations, and um, labor. Uh, and we were able to pass it. And, and actually, just um, on Thursday, uh, the state uh, issued its SB 35 streamlining mm -hmm. list, saying to say this is officially the communities that are streamlined at which income levels, because the bill does it by income level. So if you're meeting your market rate arena, but not your low income, you're streamlined in low income, but not market rate. And so San Francisco, for example, uh, has been meeting its uh, um, market rate arena. So San Francisco is not currently streamlined for market rate, it's only for below market rate. Uh, but what that list showed, and it was not, I guess a surprise, but it's still shocking, is that over 97% of jurisdictions, cities and counties in California, over 97% are falling short of their arena goals. About two thirds of the, of the jurisdictions in California, it's about 550 jurisdictions, so about two thirds are falling short of everything. Um, the other third is typically meeting its market rate but not its um, below market rate. Uh, there are 13 cities uh, in the state that are meeting everything. And you might think those might be bigger cities that have a more robust affordable housing for enough. Uh, they are uh, cities, uh, including Beverly Hills and Puerto Madera, uh, that manage, because the arena process is broken, to get a microscopic arena. So uh, Beverly Hills, I believe, had a arena over eight years of three units. <laughs> uh, so, so one of my bills, which I'll get to, SB 828, and try to fix arena to make it more data uh, driven based on actual growth projections. Um, uh, so the bill is now in effect, 
Um, and uh, so this year, I introduced uh, three bills uh, uh, on housing. One of them, which I imagine probably will not be a big topic of discussion today, but is important, is SC 829, which is our farm worker housing bill. Uh, there is a dramatic shortage of farm worker housing in agriculture areas. Uh, and so this bill will make it easier for agriculture, for farmers, to build housing um, for their uh, workers and have a, a nonprofit affordable housing organization manage it. So you don't want your boss and your landlord to be the same person. Um, and, uh, and try to have more, you know, so we don't have farm workers uh, living in their cars, living in a motel uh, two hours from before they work. Um, and then, uh, but so putting that aside, so um, SB 27. Uh, which I see the sign. Thank you for uh, for caring about the bill, even if you disagree with it. Um, uh, so, uh, sort of big picture here. Uh, California has a housing deficit in the millions. Uh, it's, it's it's you know millions of shortage. Uh, and uh, you know in the Bay Area, um, in the last seven years, we have added uh, for every um, for every eight jobs that we've added. 2010 in the Bay Area, we've added one unit of housing. Eight jobs, one unit of housing. Uh, this state in general has been growing for a long time. Uh, and in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, a number of cities, including San Francisco, including Los Angeles, down zones. Los Angeles in the 80s down zones so aggressively that they chopped in half their zoned housing capacity. If you theoretically built everything to zoning, they chopped it in half. San Francisco down zone in the 60s and 70s repeatedly, including even having like 40 foot height limits on Van Ness. Uh, and, and so we have uh, made it harder and harder to create housing in California for many years. Uh, and so now we have a deficit in the millions. And that deficit grows by 100,000 every year uh, because um, the, our, our legislative analyst tells us that California need, needs to add every year 180,000 units of housing statewide just to keep up with growth. We're not even talking about making up for the past deficit, just to keep up with growth. In reality, we produce 80, so it grows by another 100,000 a year. And as we uh, have this growing deficit, we all see the impacts. Uh, we see the impacts when displacement happens, when people are not able to afford to live here. If someone loses their rent control apartment uh, and they have no other options. Uh, we see it when uh, families uh, leave because they have that second kid uh, and they can no longer make a go of it in a one bedroom apartment and there is absolutely nowhere for them to go that they can afford. Uh, there's actually been some press in the last few days about um, some school districts, one in San Jose, well, a school district in San Jose, uh, that they have, are seeing declining, significant year after year declining enrollment because of the cost of living, because families can't afford housing or leaving and they're now closing some schools. Cupertino also is seeing declining enrollment because of lack of affordability. So it has so many impacts on people, <clears throat> real people, and doing damage to our community. Uh, and housing is a hard thing. We all love our neighborhoods, and we all, myself included, you fall in love with your neighborhood the day you move in. Uh, and change, like new development, is hard. Um, but we are, as a state, strangling ourselves. We are undermining our own climate goals because as we push people out of cities and urbanized areas and create more and more sprawl, when we don't build in the Bay Area or in uh, LA, it doesn't, those people still need somewhere to live. It means that we just push them out further and further and they cover up open space and farmland and build uh, where there's no public transportation or very little. Uh, and they are now uh, doing uh, three hour a day commutes, whether you're uh, or more than that, whether you're commuting from Stockton in the San Francisco, or Modesto in the San Jose, or um, Riverside uh, into Los Angeles. Uh, and by, by doing that, you are increasing carbon emissions and undermining our climate goals. 40% of our carbon emissions come from transportation. Uh, you are undermining people's health because it is not healthy to be in a car that long in terms of back problems, diabetes. You are undermining families because people are now spending less time at home and they get home completely exhausted and they don't have time to spend quality time with their kids, it has a lot of ramifications. So this is not just a theoretical uh, debate. Um, one, and one of the very specific issues that we have in California uh, is that we have a lot of significant public transportation infrastructure 
whether it is a subway stop or a, or a fixed rail stop or um, a high frequency bus area uh, where we have zoned for intensely low density around there, including single family homes. And what that does is it means fewer people are allowed to live near public transportation. And you basically are uh, deciding that we're, gonna, we're making all these really important and major investments in public transportation, but we are not going to let very many people live around it. We're going to push people out further because we've zoned for such low density. And those people then are going to not use public transit. They're going to have to drive. Uh, and, and you create this uh, sort of uh, vicious uh, uh, cycle. Um, and so uh, SB 27 uh, basically uh, provides pretty simple that uh, in areas around good public transportation, so within a half a mile of a, um, a major hub, whether that is a subway station, a you know, BART station, Caltrain, LA Metro, a major hub, or like a ferry, um, so that's a, a major uh, kind of public transit uh, uh, node, um, uh, or an area where you have multiple bus lines intersecting, and so it's sort of a major transit connection. Uh, within a half mile of that, or within a quarter mile of a um, high frequency bus stop, um, uh, you can no longer limit density. You can't say only single family homes. People can build a single family home if they want. I grew up in a single family home, nothing against them. Uh, but you can't dictate to people, you shall only build a single family mm -hmm. home here. Um, in addition, uh, it was Statewide, 
um, with uh, uh, in a meaningful way. And the number one strategy is increased density around housing. Mm. So now, a few things I want to uh, point out. Um, there's been uh, some very good faith opposition to the bill, which I expect you probably uh, disagree. Uh, there's also been some uh, claims that I think are not um, are misleading or inaccurate. One of them is um, what happens when you do a bill like this is you, you see people immediately do a, um, a map showing visualization. Or right? we love visualization. And what when you're looking at it, you immediately have the reaction, this is going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow, everything's going to be we know that with development, it happens over a long period of time. You have to have an available parcel. You have to have a project. You have to, you know, and so this is not like tomorrow there's going to be, you know, all these new uh, uh, small to mid-sized apartments. It's going to play out over years and years and frankly decades. Uh, the second thing is uh, there was a, there have been some people that have run around and said, said this is going to cause mass demolitions. And that is absolutely false. As an initial matter, the bill does not touch local demolition controls, local rent control, local anti-displacement controls. It does not touch them. And in San Francisco, uh, it is almost impossible to get a demolition permit for sound housing. This is bill is not about replacing no. the no. No. So local communities. Wait. Local communities will be able to make their own decisions, whether it's their existing demolition controls or additional new demolition controls, they'll make those decisions. However, we are going to, the bill is going to be um, amended sometime this month uh, with some, I mean, some just cleanup, but we're going to be putting some explicit demolition controls in the bill because it is not my desire uh, for there to be demolition. Um, you know, we don't, it's not about tearing down Apartment, existing apartment buildings to build bigger ones, uh, and particularly rent control apartment buildings. Uh, we don't want them to be torn down. So we will be putting that language in, so be on the lookout when it comes out, uh, and you will see. Uh, the bill also uh, respects local inclusionary. Uh, so whatever the local inclusionary is, um, whether it's uh, you know, what, 18% now in San Francisco, uh, other places might be 10 or 15, different places do it differently, uh, that will apply um, to uh, these new buildings. And so what that means is that we will see more affordable housing produced uh, under this bill because right now if you're building a, a single family home with two or three unit building, that's not even subject to inclusionary. San Francisco kicks in, uh, I think it's 10. Mm -hmm. uh, other communities, uh, I think it might be 10, 15, even 20. Uh, but if you're now, instead of building a two unit building, uh, building a 15 unit building, you're now part of inclusionary. Or if, it's, or if you were going to build 12 units and it's now 18 units, uh, you are now at a higher, higher number of units because it's the same percentage applied to all of them. Um, so that, that's the bill in a nutshell. Um, uh, the other bill, SB um, 828, which is our arena reform, is really designed, uh, right now, Tamina is an intensely political process. You heard what I said about Beverly Hills getting three units. Um, over an eight-year period, which is outrageous. Um, there's uh, sometimes you have communities that are right similar next to each other, but dramatically different. Um, I, I don't. I meant to bring some numbers about the peninsula where we see this, but the, one of the most extreme examples is in Southern California: uh, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, and Manhattan Beach. Three communities, generally it's similar populations that are uh, contiguous, right near each other. Uh, Redondo Beach got arena allocation for eight years of about 1,400 units. Uh, and the other two, I can't remember which is which, one of them got two, and one of them got 35 or 37. Uh, so it's hyper-politicized. We want to make it more about, uh, much more data-driven about actual population and job growth projections, uh, and, and, and stop some of the gaming of arena uh, that we see. I don't think uh, San Francisco has not really done that. The cities tend to get large arena allocations. Sometimes it's the smaller, wealthier cities that are able to effectively, effectively exempt themselves out by getting a microscopic, you know, uh, allocation that does not pass uh, the straight face test. Um, so those are the bills. Um, what we're doing, and uh, um, you know, obviously it's the beginning of the process for these for all of the bills. Uh, the what I learned in the legislature is what you introduced at the beginning often looks quite different at the end. Uh, it's a long and complicated legislative process. Uh, SB 27, uh, I said this publicly, it's a hard bill. Uh, this is not an easy bill at all. 
Uh, there's precedent for it. The state has the affordable housing density bonus where the state comes in and says to cities that a developer comes along, along and says, I'm going to do a higher level of affordability, you get to build taller and denser. That exists and has for, I think, 30 years mm -hmm. in California. So SBA 27 is not a brand new model. It's a different uh, iteration of uh, some existing precedents that exist in California law. Um, and so it'll be a process. There will be um, negotiation, et cetera. Uh, we do welcome feedback. In addition to anything you want to say today, uh, feel free to submit a letter or emails to my office um, with feedback. And obviously, if people just want to oppose the bill, for those who oppose it, everyone has a right. Uh, but we also really welcome um, thoughtful feedback. People say, you know, this is part of it where I think this should be different. You might want to consider this. We welcome that. And we read all of that. And sometimes people come forward with amazing ideas that we kind of thought of. And so we want that to go. So I'm going to stop there. I'm um, happy to answer uh, questions and uh, or just receive feedback. And thank you for, uh, for listening. So, yes. Okay. <clears throat> I live in Howie Valley on 24th Street in a three story building. So it's, you know, a, tra a trained and rich corridor. Supposing my landlord wants to build up, what's going to happen to me? You know, I mean, he, he's got to, he's got to knock walls down and this and that. Where am I going to go when the wrecking ball comes? Right, well, that's why we're going to be including. I'm going to be displaced. No, that's why we're going to be including. What do you do for the people who are going to be displaced? That's why we are, um, that's why we are including. Uh, and I get rent control. Yeah, crafting <laughs> and demolition <laughs> and displacement <laughs> measures in there because we particularly don't want rent control to be torn down. And, and in my SP35 last year, if you looked at the language, uh, we had that bill, SP35, has a categorical ban on using SP35 to tear down, to demolish rent control housing, period. Mm -hmm. Because it's not applicable uh, in that situation. Uh, and so it's something I'm sensitive to, and we are working on language which will come in sometime middle to late portion of this month uh, related to demolition. So I urge you to you know, you can look at that, and if you have feedback on it, to, to provide that yeah, to but us. But in the meantime, it's going to take quite a while for him to build the next few stories, and where am I going to go? That's my issue. Yeah. You know, what about all the people living in single family homes? We have tons of rentals in the sunset that are single family homes that are very reasonable cost. There's 20 homes on my side. <laughs> 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 Shut up! Shut up and listen, okay? I have, on my side of the block, 20 homes. Five are rentals, and they're very reasonable cost. I know exactly what they're renting for. Some people have been in these homes for years, and you're not talking about sparing the single family home. We're talking five out of 20 on my block. So you're still not amending this bill to take into consideration that a lot of single family homes are actual affordable housing. And you know, I live there, I know what the rentals are. So I, you know, I think there's a lot of potential for demolition here of single family homes. We're looking at that too. Yes. Okay. We're looking for the rentals. Yeah. All right. All right. Yes. I'm our, I've been a real estate agent here. Can we speak up, please? So, for 43 years. Can you guys hear and, me? Yeah. 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 I've been a real estate agent for 43 years here in San Francisco. I can tell you that this bill will bring about massive demolition. None of the houses in the sunset are designed structurally to accommodate additional floors without ripping out the foundations. Yes. Yes. You've got to tear them down if you're going to build upward. It will bring massive chaos to our neighborhoods, the way this bill is working. Yes. And, that, and that's why, so I will say again, first of all, the city can put whatever demolition controls it wants in under this bill. And we will be putting anti-demolition language into the bill. And so I would encourage you to give us feedback on that language this later this month when it goes in. We will welcome that feedback. The other point I wanted to make, this is such a magnanimous bill that it shouldn't be legislated. It should be put on the ballot for the people to decide. It's too big a change. Two quick questions. Um, one is about, I, I, myself and a lot of people I know feel that Samson is getting noticeably less safe 
not only for auto, but burglaries, home invasions. Two weeks ago, just from Carabell, there was an armed carjacking with the gun of a minor. Um, and it's, th that's in here, so downtown is, is much worse. So I'd love to understand what is being done about the more sort of violent crime. And then secondly, uh, what is being done to ensure that California isn't penalized in a new ta federal tax plan? So, um, yeah, so in terms of violent crime, and, uh, and, uh, and we've seen an explosion <laughs> of property crimes in uh, San Francisco. We have a debate about um, you know Prop 47 that was passed in 2014, uh, which I supported, and I think it passed overwhelmingly in San Francisco. Uh, and um, but, Pro but Prop 47 didn't implicate uh, violent crime. So a lot of, uh, and we have seen an increase in property crimes, although in fairness, um, uh, and my view has always been before we judge Prop 47, uh, you gotta give it time to play out. Um, and uh, the increase in property crimes began before Prop 47 was passed. I think it began like in 2011 or 2012. Uh, and, and recently, my understanding is that San Francisco's trends on property crimes are not consistent with the state as well. The state, um, uh, the in increase, if there was an increase, was much, much smaller. So there's, there's something happening here. Um, in terms of violent crime, uh, there um, we've not seen the kind of explosion. Um, so we, well, in, but in San Francisco, when I was in the Board of Supervisors, I don't get a vote on this anymore, uh, but I was in the Board of Supervisors, and I was a very strong advocate for having an adequately staffed police department. We had allowed our police department you know, we define it as 1900, in the charter, it says 1,971 officers are full staffing. That number was, even before it went in the charter, it was formulated when Diane Feinstein was the mayor of San Francisco. We were a smaller city population-wise. Uh, there is so much more here now, neighborhoods that didn't even exist then. Uh, and, uh, and so I did a resolution on the Board of Supervisors to say, to do the city's policy, that that number uh, tracked population growth, which would mean that we, our minimum staffing should be more like 2,200, 2,300. We had actually allowed um, at the, and this happened largely before I took office, and part of it was a recession, I'm not criticizing anyone. Uh, they didn't run police academy classes for years. And then you had a big wave of people who were hired in the late 70s, the late 80s, who hired. We went down to under 1,700 officers in 2000. Uh, and so we worked very hard uh, during my six years, not just me, but Katie Tang and Carmen Chu before her and others, uh, to uh, fund three to four police academy classes a year. And I don't know what the exact number is now, but if it's not back up to that 2,000 level, it's much closer. Uh, but we have more work to do. Because when you don't have enough police, police officers, it means uh, what gets shorted are the beat cops, the people who are just in the neighborhood all the time. Uh, and uh, it, you, know, you have these uh, staffing shortages where uh, you know, you've all seen this in terms of the response time, in terms of, of all of that. So we, you know, the board did fund fewer police academy classes last year than we had before. I was, again, as, uh, as someone who's no longer making those decisions, I was disappointed to see that because I think we need more. Uh, and, you know, in terms of, it's interesting, some people say don't hire more police officers because, you know, we've had some abuses by police. But, you know, the reality is that when you're, when you're having more police academy classes, what you're doing you are bringing uh, more young people uh, into the department. I, I, when I was on the board, I would go to all the police academy uh, graduations. It was, I mean, you know, we do all this work to fund them. I wanted to see the results. And you have, uh, you know, classes of, you know, much more women, much more diverse, just really the, the slice of our um, younger generation. And that's what really ends up changing police culture uh, in addition to uh, having more officers. So I think we need to stay uh, in that direction, because it happens some really uh, disturbing things uh, happening. Um, yes, no tax. Uh, yes, Please. taxes. Uh, tax bill was a, um, a, an abomination mm -hmm. on, for many, many reasons. Um, and, uh, and it was an attack on California and um, New Jersey, New York, other uh, blue states that also have uh, income taxes. Uh, and a higher home values, so higher property taxes. Uh, and uh, we need to, you know, once uh, you know, in the future, if we have different government in Washington, D.C., uh, we need to uh, repeal that. Um, we do have a bill working that um, just passed out of the Senate, authored by our Senate President, Kevin De Leon, uh, to uh, authorize uh, the creation of um, basically allowing people to pay their taxes as a charitable contribution into a fund that funds government services. Uh, you know, there, there is some 
dispute about whether that is legal and taxpayers will of course have that choice whether to do it or not. Um, a long ways to go in the process and I have no idea if the governor would sign it. Uh, but we are looking at some different creative ways to try to uh, address this impact in California. Um, yeah, so, and then, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, my concern, I guess, is more global, uh, not global, but you speak on here. A, a illegal or undocumented uh, criminal, they can be prosecuted according to state attorney uh, Becerra. I, and I find, I mean, the, the police go out every day risking their lives, and yet, there, I, I worry, does the state legislature have the facts yeah. of the police to breathe? I'm very, you touched on this, and this is this bill that it's already passed the Senate. It's the workaround bill which deals with um, the tax reform bill that was passed, <coughs> whereby um, people rich people in California who have property taxes that are more than 10,000 or state taxes that are more than 10,000, that they can now be able to donate to this uh, state-funded charity, which is yet to be created, because that is another bill that's going to be presented. Now, how in the world does that help the uh, the middle class citizens of this state because most of them do not have taxes that are 10,000 or more or have property taxes that are 10,000 or more. So it seems like a small minority is going to benefit and yet uh, the, the rest of the middle class does not. And, and I find that very, very disturbing and uh, how how can yeah. that be justified? So did people generally hear the question? Yes. 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 Okay. So yes. I'll answer them one by one. Uh, the first is on taxes. Um, California actually has a very dysfunctional and unstable tax system. And that's why we veer back and forth. particularly on high earners, is the most volatile uh, form of taxation. I mean, if you get either an enormous amount of money, or all of a sudden it just collapses. And the reason, we've done that, and these are really hard conversations, you know, we've moved away from relying on property taxes. Um, uh, and by the way, there is going to be a proposal this year um, to reform Prop 13 to take commercial property uh, out of public Higher, and there are higher income people who are paying the alternative minimum tax 
and already uh, have fewer or eliminated uh, itemized deductions. So there are uh, a lot of middle class people in California who are going to be hurt by the tax bill, and that's why we're just looking at ways uh, to try to help people. And then finally, on sanctuary, um, you know, the sanctuary, uh, um, you know, we passed a sanctuary bill, um, SB 54, and uh, <laughs> sanctuary ordinance are very clear that people are to comply with federal law. Uh, and what this is, SB 54 and San Francisco sanctuary ordinance is about is not about violating federal law. It's about saying that that federal government, if you're going to enforce your immigration law, that's your choice. Uh, but our uh, law enforcement officers are not going to enforce federal immigration law. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you know when you start uh, when you start when people the minute Immigrant communities uh, view police officers as ICE agents. Uh, is the minute where people stop reporting crimes, stop wanting to go to court. Uh, we know in California, uh, after last election, given the statements by our then candidate, now president, about what he wanted to do, we saw a decline in reports of domestic violence by Latinos in California. Uh, people are scared to go to the police because they think they're going to get deported. So all we're saying is, Whatever you're going to do, you're going to do on immigration, uh, federal government. But we are not going to enforce your law for you. And under the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, we're not required. Mm -hmm. So we're not violating uh, federal law. Mm -hmm. um, I am someone who's always taken public safety very seriously. Um, and uh, that's why I supported increasing police staffing and often got beaten up uh, for doing that. Uh, and I support uh, our police. Uh, but uh, we have to also uh, make sure that immigrants feel comfortable coming. Um, so, let's see, um, Bob, no. um, I actually have a lot to say, and I've talked a lot in the past, and I've written you before, so I'm actually going to give uh, my friend Claire, who's my neighbor, who I know uh, uh, doesn't come out to this stuff that often, um, and I met her last year, and she's amazing, I want to give her an opportunity to, to spit say a piece about housing stuff, or whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was thank, thank you for everything that you are doing. Um, with respect to housing, um, look, like my husband and I make decent incomes, I consider us middle class. We couldn't afford an affordable house in the sunset. So we are very interested in having more housing built. I support your bill wholeheartedly. And I just need to point out that a lot of this keep the neighborhood the same talk, these neighborhoods were zoned the way they were to exclude people of color. that because you're benefiting from it do a deep soul search okay like you might look around and say but there's a lot of Asians here like that's not good enough okay we have a lot of underrepresented groups that is for a reason and if you do not if you do not support more housing it'll only continue and you will only contribute it to that contribute to that no matter whether you voted for Trump or not can I piggyback thank on you that? can I piggyback on that on a very okay I actually wanted to turn the floor over to someone else that wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I talk a fair amount to people, often very young people, in the LGBT community, especially oh, in the LGBT community, and especially trans people who live all over the state and all over the country thanks to this wonderful thing you talked about earlier called the internet. Mm. <laughs> and who are worried about their future in the places where they live. And who want to come to a place like the Bay Area. And they ask, what would it take for me to come and live in the Bay Area mm. where I'll be accepted to work and go around and assume that people will be at least moderately friendly to <laughs> And I have to tell these people, well, here in an apartment, if you're lucky for like fifteen hundred pounds, fifteen or fifteen hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. I think I'm And my question to you is: I think that there's a structural issue with the way that we're doing politics, where we have a bunch of people in the room here who have 
legitimate concerns, the concerns of one segment of the population, mm -hmm. and who are not touched by these kinds of issues. How do we make sure that we bring in a wider variety of voices? Mm -hmm. um, that's really my question. Like, I, I would love to have any ideas for these, like, well, how do we do that? Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you breathing up? I'm done. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, one, one, around housing in particular, one thing, um, you know, I was sworn in to the Board of Supervisors January 2011, and even just over the last, you know, whatever, seven, seven years, uh, I've seen uh, there's more um, uh, diverse voices in terms of viewpoints uh, around housing uh, that are being represented. And I think actually today, uh, you know, even though people are, you know, booing or applauding and all that, it's like it's a democracy and it's beautiful. Um, the, the fact that we're you know, have a community town hall where housing is a really, you know, passionate issue uh, for, you know, probably almost everyone here, if not everyone, and you have very divergent perspectives to, uh, represented. So I, I feel like uh, because of the depth of this housing crisis and how the, and everyone, I think, probably agrees that we are in real crisis because of the different perspectives of how to solve it. Um, uh, you know, we are, uh, because of how serious it is and the damage it's doing, um, I think more voices are being uh, brought out. And I think that's healthy. It's healthy. I'm, I'm glad that there are people here who oppose SB 827. You're my constituents, some people I've worked with in the past, tell me what they think, and I applaud that. And I'm glad that there are people here uh, who support it. So I think we do have a healthier dialogue around housing where people can sometimes have uncomfortable conversations, but important conversations. Because the Bay Area has always, you know, I came here 20 years ago as a 27 year old. Um, there are a lot of, you know, I was lucky. I came here, had a job lined up. Um, I was able to rent a place. Um, uh, I could not afford to move into my own neighborhood today, by the way, if I were to start that all over again. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of, you know, this is a place where young people have always come, whether it's, you know, uh, people immigrating uh, from Mexico, whether it is the hippie, you know, hippies came here in, you know, the 60s and beyond, uh, whether it's LGBT people, whether it's just people who just decide, I want to live in the Bay Area because it's a, the best place on the planet. Uh, and we, you know, what, one of the hallmarks of this region is that we, we really want to welcome people here, and it's hard to welcome people if housing is So, um, okay. Um, yeah, yes, and then, and then, and then Pam in the back, in the gray. Yes, yeah, so after, after her will be you, okay? Stop, thank you for taking my question. First of all, one quick statement I wanted to make about our housing crisis, because, you know, I'm, you know, here in Newman Valley, we're experiencing this, almost on a weekly basis. Houses get bought by speculators. A house behind my, my, my street goes up, you know, totally, you know, a dump. For 1.5 million, guess how much the speculator paid? 2.2. If we could actually stop the speculation, because no mom and pop, no <coughs> you know, starter, you know, family, young family, you know, who scrape and they could pay 1.5 million could compete with them. It's impossible. So that's you know that's my statement to all the people here who are saying, well, we need more housing. Well, if you could cut off the speculation, that's a huge <laughs> step. In, you you could laugh, but then you know, like you know, think about it. Think about it. So so my next question to you is: a lot of my neighbors are asking about RH1, RH2 distinction, and where in your bill is going to allow, you know, more units being allotted into an RH1 home. I kind of thought the statement in the bill was exempting maximum density control. But that's easy. No, no so it's, and, and I, I will say this is one of the, this bill is not always the easiest one to describe. And, and um, the whole thing about maximum, minimum, it's like, it's been really confusing. Yeah, actually, the original reporting on the bill, the LA Times, we got them, I think we got them to fix it, reported that the bill will require sort of a minimum height be 45, 55, 85. Well, it's this zoning typically, not always, there is such a thing as minimum zoning heights, but that's very, very rare, and we don't have that in San Francisco. Um, what, uh, zoning is typically a maximum height. Your maximum height is 40 feet or 65 or you know, 300 feet, whatever it is, and then the building can be up to that height, but doesn't have to be uh, that height. So what uh, the bill provides is when it says 45 or 55 or 85 feet, that that is 
what we call the minimum maximum. So it's still the maximum, uh, but it's the minimum maximum you can have. People can still build under it. Uh, someone can come forward, and this happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. In terms of the project, what they want to do, what has to, someone can come forward and say, I want to build a single family home. That's what I want. Or I want to build a three unit building. I don't want a, a bigger apartment. And people may have many reasons for doing what they're going to do, or maybe the lot size, it just, that's what you know really makes sense. Uh, and so, uh, um, but, but people will have that, that choice. So that, can you make like six units in an RH1? That's a specific question. Depending on the size of the lot and, and all that. So at four, if you think about it, at 45 feet, right? Um, at 45 feet, that can be a, a, that can be a four-story building. And right now, it's typically zoned. I believe it's sunset. I think so. At 40 feet. Um, so right now, in the, in 45. The reason you add five on that's actually more modern zoning. Always adds five feet on because for the ground floor, you might want it to be a little bit taller. It's just better architecturally. Um, so 45 feet, the same as 40 feet. It's four stories up to, uh, and depending on the size of the lot, you know, you know I. I when my first seven years I lived here, I lived in the Castro at, on uh, Collingwood Street. It was a um, four-story building, so it was probably at 40 feet, uh, and it was sort of ground floor with nothing, and then um, three stories, and each had two units, so it was a six-unit building. So that's what we're talking about, those kind of six, maybe eight, ten, or so, uh, those smaller kinds of apartments. Thank you. Yeah. And you, in the back there. So one of your fallbacks for this uh, project is local regulation on, on demolition, and that depends on a functioning planning department. And as a local homeowner, it doesn't feel like the planning department really works for us. It feels like it can be paid off, like you can get what you want in our planning department. And I find all this talk about housing really hard when we don't have a housing department that seems, I mean, a, a planning department that actually seems to function. I have a four-story building behind me that's for a single family, it's for a couple, and it could house, you know, three nice flats. And, you know, it, anyway, I, so I find that disjuncture. <coughs> and the second question I have is, what's happening with Candlestick Point and that development? Because that's where density could be so effective. So, so two things, and what I have learned, what I have learned in my now seven years as a legislator, uh, is that uh, my control over departments that I set rules for and those vision is exceptionally limited. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there are times, you know, the number of times the board and, and and someone, I think it might have been Mark Leno taught me this right after I was elected to the board. He said, "Remember, Scott, when you pass a law, sometimes it's tempting to still say, okay, I passed it, signed, yay." Move on. No, your job is to start because you have to monitor, monitor, monitor the implementation. And a number of times on the Board of Supervisors, I would pass something in the law, and then you find out a year or two later that whichever department it is was not either hadn't implemented it at all or was getting it wrong. At the state level, it is exponentially more challenging. We, I mean, we there was a, a, a law passed to require training of long-term care facility workers around LGBT cultural competency. Uh, I think they were supposed to do it in a year or two. It took like I don't know, a long time, so it happens a lot. So with the, you know, one of the, we're going to put some controls into the bill itself, um, you know, because I know there have been some issues. Uh, but um, I, you know, I, I believe you. After all these years, I understand some of the challenges with the, the planning department. It can be frustrating when you don't feel like the laws are being um, enforced. But with, with Candlestick Hunter's point, um, uh, that that was approved actually even before I was in the board of supervisors in 2010, approved for I believe 12,000 units of housing, a brand new neighborhood, everything. Um, you recently got some. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was a ballot measure though. The, no. No, you did more. Okay, good. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. That's great. Um, and so I know there's some issues with that contractor that falsified some of the toxic reports. I'm sure that will you know be worked through. Um, and, uh, and the first, but that's going to take years. It's building a whole new neighborhood. Same with uh, Treasure Island. It's just creating a new neighborhood. Yeah. Woo. Uh, so, Mary, and then you. Hi. Um, I have kind of a larger context question. So I don't know how much you can do or the California State Senate can do about this, but when you talk about housing and the environment and all these things, California is getting San Francisco Bay Area is getting 30,000 people a year moving here, and California is getting hundreds of thousands. There's just, it's not possible to build our way out of, because supply and demand doesn't, wait, supply and demand. Can I, can 
I ask everyone, um, I'm sorry, I should say at the beginning, if, if you like what someone says, just do like Josh now. <laughs> 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 if you don't like it, do a top down, just so we're not interrupting people. Thank okay. you, sorry. Uh, let me finish, because supply and demand doesn't really apply to housing, and it never has. And I've got studies from, from Sydney, from Vancouver, from a lot of places, because really it's driven by developers and for high income, I mean, even for affordable housing. But my question larger than that is, is that like instead of pulling more people to California, drought state with environmental issues, how is there any way that you can do things like encourage the major companies that are here, both in agribusiness and tech, to spread the wealth, to go to places that have housing, where we can yeah. set up hubs and spread and spread the wealth like across the country. Like there are places that could use growth, that could use that, the places near universities that have qualified people that would love to reinvest in their areas. Now I realize this is not just a local question, but my question is, is there something that California as a state, as you and legislator, can talk about? You know, we lead in discussions about things. Can we start that? So, first of all, excuse me, um, on your first point about supply and demand, and I'll find out, I, I respect your position on it, I don't agree. Um, and we've seen actually a concrete example Seattle, South and Washington, D.C., there are some cities that have significantly ramped up their housing production and have seen rents go down. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, we, well, we have a situation uh, where we're, again, producing one housing unit for every eight jobs we had, and, you, and then you see housing prices goes up, go up. I think that's sort of proof in the pudding that it is about we don't have enough supply to meet demand. But in terms of the demand, uh, so, you know, two things. There's a, the people, Part of it and the job. That's some of the people part of it. When I, we, the answer is no. We, we don't, government is not in the business of deciding where people can uh, People can move wherever they want to move. Um, and uh, and when, I moved, when I moved to San Francisco 20 years ago, I would have been pretty pissed off if someone said, you guys, you know, we get to decide if you move or we all make our own choices. And when, you know, and, and the fact that people are continuing to come here, this, even though we have high housing costs, show that people really want to be here. Uh, and so, so I, you know, people are going to go where they're going to go, and, uh, and, and we need to anticipate that, project for it, and plan for it. In terms of the jobs, you see some of that naturally. Frankly, we see some companies that have decided not to expand here because the cost of housing is too high. Their workers can't find a place to live, so they're expanding elsewhere. Part of that is natural. You know, you're going to have ups and downs and cycles. Um, but if we get to the point where we are discouraging companies from coming here, expanding here, uh, you, may, you know, even though you may think that that sounds good now, in the future, when you have an economy that sort of craters out and it's not a job center anymore, when I, you know, back and I, when I was deciding whether to move to San Francisco in the, nine, in the mid '90s, I remember someone saying there, amazing city. Uh, it is a tourist town that has no economy left. Mm -hmm. That's what someone said to me. Well, we now have, we're still a tourist city, and that's great, um, a lot of revenue, uh, a lot of business, uh, but we now have companies that are headquartered, mm -hmm. companies that want to, that have come in here or started here and stayed here, uh, and, and that, it's put a lot of pressure on housing, and we haven't built enough housing, uh, but it's created a lot of great things for the city, too, and so I, I just personally don't think we should discourage jobs. Can I just follow up on yeah. that? Because I'm really concerned about things like the tax breaks we're giving to multi-billion dollar companies that kind of undermine, it switches the whole economy. Pardon me? They're expiring, I don't think they'll be there. Oh, good. Yeah, so, yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to thank you for the work you're doing towards ensuring that those of us who are not fortunate enough to already have a house, to already be renting a place, can eventually maybe buy a place or if they choose so, to continue renting here. Mm. I think an incumbency advantage is not fair. Just because you have a place doesn't mean you get to ignore everyone else and say, oh, why don't you live in Tracy? Why don't you live in the Sierra Nevada? We ain't got no room for you here. Well, we can't continue to have a vibrant economy if we don't have people here, say, taking care of the elderly who seem to be opposed to this bill or who 
clean up our streets, and our food, and build our buildings. And I think there's no future for the city if we don't increase density, if we don't increase jobs, new quality transit centers, if we don't do anything for the next few generations. So thank you for working hard for those of us who are actually going to be alive in a decade or two. job cannot be moved to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so I support SB 827. <laughs> My question, it, 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 I, I, I'm with Stop Crime SF and we're involved in the auto <coughs> breaking issue and we applaud you for your your work on, on this specific legislation. We would al also like you to consider some of the bills, <coughs> the, the, the assemblyman from uh, um, Elk Grove, I, I, I think. Cooper. Cooper. Yes, um, uh, some legislation that, that would make repeat offenders of any kind of uh, 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 burglary receive up and, 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 and you know, so this wouldn't be a wobbler offense. It would have to be a, a felony. Yeah. So uh, I, I realize 47 might have to yeah. be amended. So 
Um, Jim Cooper, who's an assemblyman from the Elk Grove area, does have a bill to make some adjustments there. Um, my understanding is that there is discussion going on. I think that the governor will probably propose an alternative to that. Uh, and my suspicion is that we will see a negotiation to make some changes, you know, uh, to address the issue that you're talking about. Um, so I, I, I have, I'm cautiously optimistic we will see a reform, uh, but there will be a lot of dialogue before that happens. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Tim, and then. Scott, uh, you deserve enormous credit for taking this on. It's a, a ray of hope that the state will finally start to address the challenges that are, that are so squarely in front of us. Uh, I'm happy to support it in any way I can. Uh, would it be possible for you to give us a quick update on high-speed rail and the water tunnels? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, uh, speaking of our 19th century water system. Um, and I and just, and the reason why I'm so passionate about water, uh, water recycling is we have all of these huge fights, the Bay Area and LA, agriculture in the cities. We're fighting over this finite and, you know, frankly diminishing resource. If we just really got serious about water recycling, like Australia did when they had like, what, a 15 year drought that you start wondering, are we gonna continue to exist? Or Israel, they recycle an enormous amount of work. We shouldn't be having these things. The water recycling technology is to the point where you can recycle pretty much any water for anything. And people will, there will be big factor, people will adjust over time. Uh, but we don't do enough. And, and water recycling costs, or I should say desalination, costs five times as much as water recycling. Mm. It is much more expensive, it has more environmental uh, impacts. And so for me, desalination is the last resort, but we need to do a lot more water uh, recycling. Um, the governor proposed his twin tunnel um, uh, project that he's been pursuing for since Jerry Brown part one. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I, will, I just want to say for the record, he is probably the most talented politician I've ever experienced in my life. He and I don't agree with him on, on everything, but he, I, I just don't, he's, he's like this force in nature. Uh, but this one, he was hitting a wall. So he's now proposed, I think, a single tunnel. Yes. And I think part of the, and I didn't support the twin, I was opposed to the twin tunnels. Uh, and I think part of the concern was the governor said, you know, we're gonna take a limited amount of water out of the Delta to go south. And the question is, so why are you building two mammoth <laughs> tunnels that can take a lot more? So I think by making it smaller and only one, um, he's trying to send a message that no, we're serious. When we, so I'm, I'm hopeful that there can be some sort of solution uh, uh, to this. High-speed rail, um, and I am a strong supporter of high-speed rail. I think it is um, embarrassing for California that it takes twice as, taking, getting from San Francisco to LA takes twice as long on a train as it does to drive. It's like 11 or 12 hours. Uh, and we can't keep expanding our freeways. It's not sustainable. It's unbelievable. Widening like freeways from state end to end of the state Shocking, like unbelievably expensive. We're not going to keep doing that. Uh, and our airports are running out of capacity. Uh, the run, we just can't, we have to have real train service. And uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, I, a lot of us are very committed to making it a reality. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, for those of you who follow me on social media, once a year, I, I do it every year with my annual ritual, there is a uh, in terms of the cost increases high speed rail. Once he, uh, there's a 19, January 1966 amazing front page of the Chronicle talking about the BART boondoggle and have we been tricked and because BART's expenses had gone up and they were just trashing BART. And this is just a fantasy and never going to happen. Uh, and imagine the Bay Area without BART. Mm -hmm. Golden Gate Bridge, cost increases, opposition, imagine not having a Golden Gate Bridge. So every major transformational um, transportation infrastructure project ever, pretty much, has had, it's more expensive than you think it's gonna be, it's taken longer. Uh, high school rail is no different. I think we are gonna get it done. Um, and uh, I think we're then gonna wonder what, how we ever uh, lived uh, without it. So who did I, I pointed someone, yes. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Winston Parsons. Uh, my sister and I are lucky to be fourth generation San Franciscans. And many of my friends that work and neighbors um, are starting to raise families and I don't know if they're going to have second generation San Franciscans for their kids they might have to move. Um, so 
I'm not opposed to welcoming new people here. I'm not opposed to raising heights in certain areas. Um, you know, I, I live near Geary, and I see like one-story buildings, and I see five-story buildings, and I wouldn't be visually opposed to a larger building. Uh, that being said, I think there are some things that are missing from your bill. First, you mentioned you want to keep uh, funding services, and there's no, I don't see any additional funding for essential services, schools, fire, police, attached to this bill, and uh, extra people who will come in. Um, my other concern is that a lot of this development will require people moving if there is a development. Um, would you consider putting legislation or amending the legislation so there was something about right of return for people who were displaced from their homes so they can come back? Would you, would you include something for subsidizing interim housing for people who have to move yes. for yes. construction? Yes. Yes. Would yes. you consider supporting funding for nonprofit housing developers and giving them first opportunity to build more affordable housing? Yes. Because I, I, I honestly, I come from a family that developed property and I do not trust for profit developers yeah. to look out for individuals' best interests. Right. Yes. Yes. So a few things. In terms of impact fees, um, as I, I'm sure you know, impact fees, local communities in San Francisco is not shy about impact fees. In fact, when I was on the uh, Board of Supervisors, um, I authored legislation, which was really hard, years and years, to um, increase the transportation impact fees on commercial property and for the first time ever, put them on residential development. They had never been an exemption since 1980. So we did that, and I took, it was a big fight, it took like years, and we got it done. Um, and of course we have inclusion errors. And then there are the other, the, the botany of the fire department, sewer hookup, and all that. Uh, and when you are building, uh, say a 10 or 12 unit apartment building, instead of a single family home, or two unit, you're gonna, more inclusionary, you're going to pay more transit impact fees, you're going to pay a much higher sewer and water hookup fee, you're going to pay more to the fire department. You're going to, when you develop bigger, you pay more impact. So that happens naturally. It's just going to be a, it's a bigger impact on the system. So we will see an increase in fees with an increase in development. Um, in terms of the right of return, uh, a few people have mentioned that to us, and we're looking at that to see what. You know, if there is something that could feasibly fit in, so we are taking a hard look at that. And in terms of nonprofit developers, you know, I'm someone who I have, uh, and nonprofit, when you say nonprofit developers, these are people who build 100% affordable housing. Uh, and so what we were talking about before with the uh, fees, the feeding out instead of building on site, that money goes to nonprofit developers to build 100% affordable housing. Uh, but for my entire time in public life, I have been a fighter for more public investment. Um, campaigning for the affordable housing trust fund, uh, supporting uh, two bills that I co-authored last year, SB2 and SB3, uh, which increased the state's investment in affordable housing dramatically. Uh, one of them is a bond that's been available this year. Uh, so billions and billions more for affordable housing. So we want to make sure these nonprofit developers have the resources they need, particularly because the tax bill, another little uh, dud in that tax bill, was that by cutting the corporate uh, tax rate, uh, you undermine the federal low income tax credit. It becomes less valuable to tax it. Uh, and so we're going to have to step up even more in San Francisco and California to fund uh, affordable housing. In terms of right of first refusal, I mean, this is generally it's private property. Someone owns the property, whether it's your family or whether it's whoever else. Uh, and, you know, we, it's not, you know, the city buys private property. We just did it with McDonald's on the street. And, and we have bought, you know, and when I was in the board, we bought a number of pieces property to develop as 100% affordable housing. And I support that kind of acquisition program. Um, I think it's a great program. Uh, so, so that we should continue to do. Um, but if someone owns private property, I mean, you can't force them to give it to someone else. So you can't do anything buy it. I'd like to change. I just don't think what we're doing for investing in affordable housing for low and spectrum of incomes is enough. Well, let me, let me just comment on that. Um, when I talk about subsidized affordable housing that we're paying for with public money, uh, my focus is low income housing. Because the market <coughs> in the Bay Area is, will never produce housing affordable for low income people. We need to be building that subsidized housing or buying and rehabbing. 
Um, so that's really important. Uh, for the middle class, we will never, ever subsidize our way out of the middle class housing cost. It is too big. If we start devoting significant resources in the middle class housing, all we're going to do is we're not going to even, we're still behind the low income housing, we'll be even further. The only way the middle class housing problem is going to be solved is more housing. And so I would like to focus the resources on low income. But low income isn't just destitute. Yes, it includes destitute. It also includes someone who's a Starbucks manager who qualifies as low income uh, in San Francisco. And that's what I would like to see. So, that's my personal opinion. So, yes, you better go. Thank you, Scott. Um, a couple of comments to follow up on this gentleman on the inclusionary. I also agree that that should be a great thing to include in the bill. But a couple of thoughts along that way. One, why couldn't, if, if the state is going to get involved in zoning, why can't we have a statewide inclusionary percentage then? So that if, if you're going to say we have to have inclusionary housing, why can't LA have the same requirement? Because, you know, growing, being in Noe Valley, we've seen a lot of houses built. They've gone from unaffordable housing to super unaffordable housing. So there's, unfortunately, just growth doesn't solve our problem. We're going to, if we're going to really do it, we're going to have to force it. So I, I would support including the inclusionary in there, maybe come up with a statewide standard, and perhaps study, could we even increase that percentage? It still makes it economically viable, because a developer has, it has to be worth their while, but is there, are we at that sweet spot? I'd also like to say that maybe we could carve out some for this gentleman's daughter who's a principal or our first responders to be able to afford to be in San Francisco. So th those are a couple thoughts. And as to his issue of first party refusal, I agree with you, you can't force who someone sells their property to, but you could say you don't get the bonus density if you don't comply with, uh, you know, for a certain period of time, if you're not gonna uh, agree to either have a certain amount of affordable or, or have first right to a nonprofit. So there are ways that still within that. My only other just comment, I'm sorry, just the thing that gives me pause though about this bill, and I know it's for good purposes, and I support that we need more housing, but I, I, I am concerned about the state telling us how to zone our cities. And what might be good for San Francisco may not be good for Los Angeles or Napa or whatever. So I just think, and I know this is for a good reason, I think we really have to give pause to, is that's the, why isn't the Board of Supervisors doing this? And I, you know, you were on the board, so I'm sure you probably did try to do this. But isn't this something the board should do? Well, do? so uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning what you call the sweet spot on the inclusionary percentage. That I totally agree with. Sometimes uh, when we have debates about inclusionary, uh, people say, "Let's go with 25 percent," and and say, well, "Why? What is it about 25 percent?" Well, it's a nice round and good-looking number. Well, then let's go with 50 percent. That's an even better number. Uh, and we, we know that our goal, people don't live in percentages. People live in units. So the goal is to produce the largest number of affordable units. Uh, so you could set the inclusion or really high, set it at 50%, and for the projects won't get built, it doesn't pencil, and then you get zero. Um, and so you're looking for that number where it's, you're going to hit that sweet spot and have the largest number of units built, which might not be the highest percent. And San Francisco just went through that when it set the 18%. It had gone 25, and then the feasibility study showed 18 uh, was, uh, um, was uh, the feasible one. Um, so in terms of local control, uh, you know, as a former local elected, uh, there are I know there are many situations where local control, uh, even complete local control, makes all the sense in the world. There are other areas that are issues of statewide concern and where there has to be a balance between the state role and the local role. So you look at something like public education, mm -hmm. right? We have a local school district, elect the local school board. Our local school districts in California have a lot of latitude in terms of what they decide locally for their community. But it's not in a it's not complete local control. The state sets a lot of standards uh, for school districts and within those parameters, they get their local control. Uh, for housing, we have had the approach, which I think is the anomaly, for many years, mm -hmm. that housing is a purely local issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the state has no role. Uh, the state passes laws sometimes, uh, but they have no teeth, or they don't get enforced. They've been on the books since the 80s, in volumes, one example, um, where they get ignored. Uh, and I believe that it, maybe that made sense at one point. Given the situation we're in now, having complete local control over housing with no state baselines or parameters, uh, it's not working anymore. And so we have communi some communities 
like frankly San Francisco. San Francisco makes a good faith effort to build housing. Redwood City, there are cities that, that really make a good faith effort to build housing. There are other cities that just decide we don't want to build any housing. Mm -hmm. or we're going to build one little four unit building and that's going to be, look at, we're going to pat ourselves on the back and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes a little bit, sometimes, um, a little bit of a race to the bottom mm -hmm. where people, that, where communities decide no housing, yes housing. And what we're saying is, that uh, the state, given this is a statewide crisis affecting our state climate goals, our state economy, uh, our state diversity, um, we, uh, the state needs to set parameters, and then within those parameters is the local control. And it's a shift, it's a change, it is always clunky and painful and leads to a lot of debate uh, where you know, reasonable minds can differ on where you draw that line. Uh, but I think that the line uh, needs to be changed. And, and that, that's sort of where we're coming from. Not having a state take over everything, but having a different state versus local. Um, that, that's just sort of my perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Kathy, but I spell Kathy. Um, I live in Noe Valley as a tenant. I've been there for 25 years. I live in an old kind of ramshackle round, round <laughs> building uh, with 36 units. And um, one of the problems that I see in the city, oh, it was built in uh, 62, uh, it's a crane building. One of the problems in, in, that I see that affects my building and 179,000 rent control buildings in the city is that when a tenant moves, the landlords can raise the rent to market rate. And so this is devastating it's for a lot of people. Because the market rate in this old building, uh, it's kind of a mess, it's nice, it's okay, is like $3,000 for a one unit apartment. This is not helpful. So there is a move by tenants in the city uh, and in the state, you probably know, to reform or to repeal, I should say, uh, the um, Costa Hawkins. Costa Hawkins prohibits, prohibits, listen to this, prohibits um, rent control on buildings built, apartment buildings built after 1979. Also, it uh, does not allow uh, landlords, it allows landlords to raise the rent at market rate throughout the state when somebody moves in a, in a rent control apartment. In my hometown in Washington, D.C., it was at least to a comparable rate, which is much fairer than the present situation. But I think that it's important for everybody in this room to look at that, uh, in that element of those buildings that were built after 1979 and which could be put under rent control. If we can repeal this this bill. I'm, I know that you're for rent control, and I wonder how you feel about sure. repealing Costa Hawkins. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so just to clarify, with Costa Hawkins, it, the, the rule is that um, uh, typically that rent control can apply to buildings that were built up to the time that you adopt your rent control ordinance, um, no later than, I think, 1995. So in San Francisco, it's 1979, and Berkeley, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, so that or the early 80s. Uh, but in places that adopt it, say today, uh, it's around 1995 as the cutoff. Uh, and I support uh, reforming Costa Hawkins to give cities more flexibility to allow newer buildings to go into the rent control. Uh, and there are two counterbalancing things here. Number one, uh, we want to make sure that, that people have incentive to actually build yeah. rental housing. Uh, but the idea that you have this permanent distinction, so 1978 building in rent control, 1980 building not in rent control, permanent forever, uh, doesn't make sense to me. And so what I would like to see is perhaps a rolling time period where newer buildings after a certain period of time uh, can go uh, into rent control if a community decides uh, to do that. Uh, and I think that would have a very significant impact. You would give developers still a financial incentive to build uh, new rental housing, uh, but eventually buildings would transition uh, into rent control if the city has rent control. What about single family homes? What? What about single family homes? Yeah. Um, single family homes, I, you know, I think I would want to uh, distinguish between situations where someone, they own their home versus, uh, say, like a REIT or investment company that is buying up hundreds of single family homes. Uh, I, I think there, to me, I would draw a distinction uh, between the two. Um, so I, you know, and this is all a long way of saying, 
there's, there are really thoughtful ways to try to uh, talk about cost of Hopkins and inform it that would have very tangible positive benefits. The tragedy is that right now the discussion about cost of Hopkins in the legislature, that the discussion has, is so deeply polarized that it's all either repeal the whole thing or don't move one comment in it. They're not talking to each other. There was a, this battle in the legislature that as far as I could tell, there was never even a uh, discussion or negotiation or resolution. There's now a statewide ballot measure that's being proposed by a toxic organization called the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in Los Angeles, uh, which is an outcast from the HIV community, and which loses almost every single ballot measure it puts on the ballot. Um, they don't, they're, it's like, I don't know, they're not in it to win, they're in it to make a point. And so you have now someone moving this who's not interested in negotiation or finding a resolution, but just in having the fight. And so what I would say is, I would like us to move to that point, and maybe it takes going through this ballot measure, um, I don't know what's going to happen with the ballot measure, but if that ballot measure, let's say, comes close but doesn't win, if it wins, it wins. Cost of Hawkins is repealed, period. The, the debate is over. If it comes close but doesn't win, that could open a door to a negotiation because uh, the opponents know, well, maybe we have a shot in the future, in the future, but it's hard. The opponents know, hey, we, we beat it back this time, but we might lose it next time. Let's negotiate. Um, so it's either going to get repealed later this year on the ballot, or maybe we'll have an opportunity to actually negotiate and come up with a resolution that, keep, that creates incentives to build the rental housing and that protects tenants. And that's what I would like. So, um, uh, yes? Well, hundred years ago today. Not to know Valley here today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hundred years ago today, uh, the Twin Peaks Tunnel opened, and I view that as a real estate development project because that then led to uh, St. Francis Woods in this section of the city. The thing that uh, concerns me about uh, housing is uh, the fees that are assigned to it. You've got the transportation sustainability fees that was connected to a uh, matrix of uh, saying that there's a requirement for transportation in the new housing. That was then diluted by 75% into the transportation sustainability fee. So Muni's only collecting about 15 to 20 million dollars a year on that for growth. And my position is that, uh, and the transportation sustainability fee only kicks in at 21 units and exempts uh, uh, nonprofit organizations from being. So the, the real question that I look at is, how are you going to fund the infrastructure with all the growth? Because growth is not funding growth uh, when you start building all of this. So uh, that's, that's my real issue at the local level, because there's no money coming from anywhere else. Last Thursday, uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, at the Muni off-site meeting, Director Reskin basically said, that the development agreements that were already made are inadequate to fund growth yeah. of Muni. That, that, that's a true statement, because I was there. Okay. And you, you just continue going on thinking that all of this is going to be fine, but I'm saying growth needs to fund growth in the overall picture, because yeah. right now we're putting the horse before sure. the cart and not funding it. So in terms of that, I think that that number, the 10 to 15 million, it's going to go up over time because we phased, uh, we phased it in. It didn't take effect all at once. It was a gradual thing. But with that said, uh, I, you know, as someone who, again, I authored a bill to extend uh, the transit impact fees to residential for the first time, increase the personal. Obviously, I believe in transportation impact fees. Uh, uh, with that said, um, tra transportation impact fees were never intended to, like, this is the funding. Uh, for the system, and that would be really unsustainable because development goes up and down, and then it's not a reliable source. It's like one-time payments, uh, and we have to, you know, ultimately our infrastructure needs, our transportation needs, uh, have to be paid for by the taxpayers. That's why, that, that's what we we do, and so I'm all for those fees. But I would never want to just rely on those as that's how we fund transportation. It's not never going to be enough, and it's not sustainable. No, and we'll, but but and then when we do do new development, you know that is increasing our tax revenue. We're getting more property taxes. 
if there are business retail going in or office, we're getting more sales taxes, maybe um, uh, gross receipts taxes. So when we do do development, you get the immediate uh, payment of the, you know, say the property transfer tax fee, and then over time you're permanently getting property tax or whatever other tax. So I don't, I, I, it's not just about the impact because that's one time at the beginning. Over time, you're getting ongoing revenue from that new, from that new property. So Dennis. Um, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Um, I just want to say, everybody in this room, I welcome you to San Francisco. My fantasy is that at some point we're going to have more electoral votes, be able to never have another Trump elect, Trump victory in the future. And I feel your pain. Honestly, when I, I read a report about millennials not being able to have a higher standard of living than their parents, it really hit home. I have a niece who lives in the city and she's always constantly, she pays half of her income in rent and she wants to move out because she's not saving any money or building wealth. And that's a big issue as you age. If you don't build wealth, you don't have any security. So the goals of the uh, SBA 27, I completely understand the public policy rationale behind it. Just some context for the city. Since 1990, we upzoned the city to accommodate 100,000 new additional units after the area plans. 100,000 units, and I kind of, you know, whatever we did in the 60s and 70s. Could you repeat that again, please? The for, we, we, we upzoned 100,000 units in the city since 1990 through the area plans, and that should erase a lot of the, the damage we did maybe in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, we also allow an, another 30,000 ADUs to be built, and they're actually, thank you, Senator Weiner, you did it in the Castro first, and we thought the triple was actually now becoming a river, and we're on, on to the upper hundreds there. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody understands, and again, not to discount the need for uh, transit-oriented development, with the existing zoning capacity we have in the city, and I'll get to my punchline, we could build an additional 143,000 units. That's not chump change. So our pipeline alone has 60,000 units. And what does that mean? We have 5,875 currently under construction. We have 17,000 units that are approved, entitled, but not yet built. We have 30,000 that are approved in master plans like Treasure Island, Park Merced, and uh, the Hunters Point Shipyard, which I think we need to work on getting infrastructure money to allow those to get built. That's a real issue here. And then we have the additional capacity for the city that's still out there that can be built is 16,500 ADUs, 51,000 soft sites where the height is currently higher than what the building is, and that's actually significantly lower. Uh, the, the building's lower than the actual height. We have 7,200 applications currently pending that are awaiting to get entitled. And then we have 15,575 units out there waiting rezoning. So that all adds up to 143,000 units. Now, with the infrastructure idea to get those units actually built, we've got a reason why we're out not getting a lot of these units built. The number one reason is construction costs. So. I'm hearing construction costs, construction costs, construction costs, and then financing because of construction costs, because they're too high. So projects aren't penciling out. So one of the issues that I'm worried about is what I call unaffordable by cost. So even, at, even if you sold a unit at cost, half a million, whatever it, that it costs to actually make, build, how are you going to get people that can't even afford that to live in there? So this kind of missing middle, there's a gap there that's unaffordable by cost to me. Um, I think that from a make your bill better point of view, from a displacement point of view, this bill alone may have eviction and displacement uh, protections in it, but the Housing Accountability Act doesn't. So it's, it's, it's kind of bills being kind of all coupled together to actually that could incite displacement or demolition. And I know we here in the city need to work on that and make sure that we have objective standards rather than subjective standards, which we currently have. The other thing is historic preservation. Um, if we wanted to preserve every, everything that's sold, we'd still be a city of you know, one-story shacks, right? We actually demolished one on Perturo Hill last Thursday by approval that was this, that been there for hundreds of years, so it wasn't historic. However, I'm worried that uh, this is SBA 27 doesn't go far enough in terms of the CEQA ratings of the buildings themselves. So on the National Register, on the State Register, and a local landmark, is a very, very small percent of the, the homes. It's probably less than 1%. Expanding it to CEQA A structures would probably expand that by maybe at half a percent, but I'm worried about those structures. Um, on the right of first return, can you, can you send, can you send I'm gonna send all these to you. Yeah, no, okay, so absolutely. And these are to make the bill better. Um, the right of return that we're seeing at the Planning Commission is our 
our rent stabilization law doesn't go far enough. Construction normally takes longer than three months. People get evicted because they're going to add an ADU or they're going to you know, add a floor or whatever. And they move to Antioch or wherever and they never come back. So that's the real issue. The, account, the, the art, I'm sorry, the Conservatory of Music did it right. So they did a project where they're displacing tenants. They put them in buildings until the, the new building's done and had them come back at the same rent. These are the kind of things that I think would really a lot, a lot of the concerns people have around displacement and yeah. you know, impact. No, I appreciate that. Like I, I said, we are um, some people in LA actually came to us too with, you know, talking about the uh, rate of return. And so we're actually looking at that to see what it might look like. You know, it, you, I'm glad, thank you for mentioning the missing middle because you're right, construction costs for many different reasons and the North Bay buyers have exacerbated that. I mean, the, the, the shorter the construction labor, everyone being structured like that. Uh, but the, the, you know, this missing middle, which is what this bill is, right? Um, largely four and five story buildings uh, that are going to be lower construction costs because it's not steel. Uh, and, and so that, that is a good thing. So we have five minutes left. Um, so I'll take a few more. Yes? I, I have a question that's probably not very, it's, a, a subject that's not very controversial probably, unless you have bankers in this room. <laughs> Uh, it addresses the affordability and the financing issues, and that is, are you, I assume you're familiar with the effort to put together a state bank charter, and we don't have to discuss that here. It's more complicated than we need to go into. I'm just curious as to where you stand on that, and also how you think, of, are, you, are you like at, at all involved in sort of that difficult effort of making it work with regard to our relationship with the Federal Reserve. Uh, yeah, so I, um, uh, the good thing is there are some uh, really smart people in the legislature who are working on that, and so, you know, I support their efforts. Uh, I don't need to, I don't want to replicate these ones. We sort of divide them in some areas. Uh, so my uh, colleague, uh, Senator uh, Bob Kurtzberg from LA, is working on that. And one of the, uh, there are various benefits of doing that. Uh, one of them, of course, is the, the, re the fact that the federal government uh, you know, you can't, if you're a cannabis businesses, uh, find it hard or impossible to bank. And so it becomes an all-cash business, and, and, and we want to, with a state bank, it's going to be easier for us to allow cannabis businesses to bank. But there are other benefits as well, so yes, I do support it. Thank you. So, uh, a couple of years ago, the state changed its metric for measuring the impact of automobiles on new development from uh, local traffic congestion to a metric called vehicle miles traveled. Uh, and the idea was to reduce uh, sprawl, so to bring, bring density in. But by doing so, uh, we're no longer considering the impact or the possible impairment of emergency vehicle access <coughs> to the gridlock. So I think it would be helpful to have some sort of balance between these two measures, not just throw one away and go completely to the other. Uh, ask for your comment on that. Um, yeah, so I think that the, um, the goal of that change was, because right now for a long time, uh, a bus with 50 people on it was treated as identical to one vehicle with a single occupant. Uh, and the idea that it's really about your level of service, it's about um, how many, or not level of service, it's about how many people you're moving through, not how many vehicles. Uh, and you know, um, that in terms of uh, uh, impact on emergency service, I mean, the reality is that the gridlock is already here. Uh, and the gridlock gets worse, frankly, when you don't build housing near public transportation, which is what SB 2827 is about. When you, when you have a super low density around transit, uh, that means housing gets built further out, and you have more congestion and gridlock. When you concentrate more housing around public transportation, people drive less. Some people might give up their car entirely. Other people will have a car, but they're not driving everywhere, and so you reduce grid loss. And that, to me, is the most effective way to reduce uh, uh, traffic congestion. Yeah, so we'll do a couple more. Yes. Uh, earlier, when you were asked a question uh, about the role of the city versus the state um, in demolition controls, uh, you seem to assign the responsibility to the city. 
Um, for demolition control, this might be a more suitable thing for uh, city government to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, but there have been uh, a lot of people who have had concerns about SB 827 saying they would support it if amendments were introduced, which it sounds like you're working on, uh, for making sure that people have some kind of right of return. And also <coughs> that, uh, like in the case, I would like to uh, second the Commissioner Dennis's. Um, Richard, uh, Richard. Commissioner Richards' uh, comment regarding the, uh, the music conservatory, uh, which not only allowed people the right return at some, uh, or sorry, uh, put them in a nearby building where they were able to uh, rent at the same rate that they had been and rent control continued, but they also made sure that all the new accommodations were within a certain radius so that community cohesion could continue. There's a lot of um, grassroots. Uh, antagonist towards SDA 27 from the mission and other poor communities in San Francisco that I think might be alleviated if you were to address some of those concerns at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us any more about uh, these amendments that you're currently working on? No, the, the right of return was, it, it was, you know, the, the bill is a few weeks old, uh, and so it's been a, a recent discussion, so I, you know, we're, we're, we're taking a look at that and exploring it. I, I don't want to say what's going to be, because I don't know yet, because mm -hmm. we're, we're evaluating and seeing uh, what we can do. Uh, I will say, and this ties into what uh, Commissioner Richards was saying before, uh, the upzoning of the city, uh, it was concentrated in certain areas. Other than work was said, it was mostly like eastern, uh, southeastern parts of the city. Um, and, uh, uh, and the rest of the city was really not upzoned other than through in-law units, which we, were, we have been required to do for 35 years anyway. Um, and so uh, the mission uh, right now, uh, SB 27, the impact on the mission is going to be dramatically lower than many other neighborhoods. The mission already uh, has most of the bulk of it has no density controls. Eastern neighborhoods got rid of density restrictions. Uh, the mission already has an awful lot of 50 foot to 80, 85 foot uh, zoning. So the mission is already fairly tall and um, not and dense in terms of the zoning. And so. The impact of SDP 827, I'm not saying a zero impact, but it's dramatically lower than other neighborhoods. What about making sure that people are move, have some kind of compensation or accommodation to move to somewhere nearby? Yeah, so that's, that, I mean, we're looking at all of that. Uh, the, the nearby part, it, it gets more challenging when you're in an expensive market, and, and the question is, is there somewhere physically where they can go? Uh, and I, you know, dealt with this <clears throat> tragically, you know, before I was in the board of supervisors, uh, until until you are in a position where you're getting reports about every fire that happens, mm -hmm. I think you don't realize how many fires there are. And on the board supervisors, you get a text message every time there's a fire in your district. And it is eye-opening if you hadn't been following that uh, uh, before. Uh, and every time there was a fire in a park building, my first thought was, I hope everyone's okay. And then my second, uh, my second thought was, um, I feel horrible for those tenants. Because in San Francisco, we do have a right of return. If you are burned out of your apartment and they have to fix it so you get a temporarily evicted, you have a right to come back at the same rent that you were paying before. Uh, and there are some building owners, and there was one like a 15th in church into this, where they had a fire, and I think within maybe six months at the most, those tenants were back. They really diligently fixed the building and got the tenants back. Uh, there was another one at 14th in Dolores, uh, 87 Dolores. Uh, where uh, they're still not back. It happened you know, four years ago, maybe. Um, and I actually was out in the sunset, and I met a, a young family, a young couple with a kid. It was like, we're out here now, uh, you know, and we actually, we like the sunset. We're not gonna go back, and it's taking too long. So it's, um, it, it's, so, it's so variable in terms of how it happens, but, uh, but we are looking at what we can do in the bill to set some standards for that. And if you have specific feedback, you know, if you put it right in some other way, that's great. Um, yes? Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Eric Mills. I'm a full disclosure. I'm not a constituent, but I'm a fan. Folks, <laughs> 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 I'm a coordinator of Action for Animals in Oakland. Many, many members here in San Francisco. Action what? Action for Animals. Action for Animals. <laughs> my favorite thing is no. it sounds like it's safety service for Kudos. It's not. Uh, I'm also on the board of Paul Pack, California's political legislative voting chart for animals. It's a leader of the eighth grade last year. It seems highly appropriate in the city name to take the same time. St. Francis, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I have a request. I have two bills on back, coming back to Ridge Council this week. Two bills I've been working on for more than 20 years. One to require on site veterinary care at all rodeos in California. I don't know what. 
of all the signs of Indian care and all rodeos. Oh, rodeos, rodeos. Man, we're steer taking the jam. Caesar Chavez will come in and support that. We all so hope you might consider taking the dogs and get a lot of support. That's part of your constituency, which is very hard for all of the ultimate uh, work you're doing on human issues. But we wait until oh, I hear, oh, no, you hear about, oh, no, there. Yeah, I, I'm worried that the tech guardians are, uh, are not. <laughs> yeah, but if we wait until yeah. human problems are resolved, all the people will be extended. They were here, but they are not. We can do multi-tasking. Yeah. Yeah. You could be a fan of hopefully I can do Thank you. We did, uh, we passed the bill that governor signed last year to um, uh, really uh, try to drain the salon and puppy mills mm -hmm. uh, in terms of health, um, dog control in California. Um, so that was a, a big step, and um, I found, I, I know in San Francisco, you know, I did a lot of animal-related work on the board, and, and I've identified who the legislators are in Sacramento who are into it. Uh, and we're happy to take a look uh, at that. I haven't heard of that before. Thank you. Okay, so one, I think one, one more, and then Laura. Oh, my apologies, I'm sorry. That's sorry. Okay. No. Senator Mayor, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. Right. appreciate it. Um, as a member of the CERT right, we're really concerned about clean water issues. And I know that you attempted to bring water recycling into the mix here. Um, a couple of things in this neighborhood specifically. We have a, an issue with firefighting. There's not enough water in the neighborhood if there were. No auxiliaries. Yeah, no. not enough in the system. And you, you're proposing density. Of course, I, I'm going to be straight up. I, I oppose this bill. I'm going to stand with, with, uh, with people who live in a primarily uh, black neighborhood, in Crenshaw in LA. We call this a gentrification bottle. Um, uh, straight up. They call it 20th century style red line for to support 21st century growth agenda. I'm going to stand with that. But I'm going to make a suggestion. If you're going to, if you go forward with this bill, why not bring in water recycling from, you know, the, as these as these parts as we densify the neighborhoods, there's more flow into our sewage system. Here in the sunset, every time it rains, over one inch, it overflows into the bay, into the ocean. So we get our sewers are overflowing into the ocean at this point. We need more capacity and we need the money to do it. Would you explore the potential of, from a harm reduction standpoint if this horrible bill goes through? Would it be would, would you be willing to put that clean water in you know, the well, water recycling? <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't agree with the, the premise that you just stated there, but I, I do agree that the auxiliary water system has to be expanded on the west side um, and that uh, we have some sewer capacity issues, not just out here, but over a mile supervisor district in Cayuga um, and other areas where the, uh, you have uh, these huge problems. And part of it is that we have to combine. You guys know we have a combined sewer system where rainwater and sewage goes in the same pipes. Most cities don't have that. We have it in Sacramento. That it would be like the expense of separating it is not easy. It's just off the charts. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very supportive of infrastructure changes to address that. Um, one thing I, I will just say, and you mentioned that, um, you know, the, the, the control group in LA that uh, talks about how this is gentrification. What, what causes gentrification is not having enough housing. And we've seen that in neighborhoods yeah. in San Francisco that have had very little housing, yet are experiencing significant displacement. Uh, and uh, to refer to this bill as redlining is um, is almost, uh, this is not you, you're repeating what they said, I think it's almost like a, it's like a, uh, it's, it's like a bad joke. Because when you look at the history, and, and this is, and this is, again, I grew up in single family homes, I'm not commenting on who lives in single family homes. Single family home zoning was created uh, after, immediately after the Supreme Court struck down racial zoning. It was created explicitly to keep black people out. So the idea is one, is one person. So the idea, the idea that saying we want to put more apartment buildings in a neighborhood, and that is redlining, uh, is is uh, again for, the, for this, this guy in LA said it's absurd. Uh, that's my opinion of being right. I'll tell him that you said that his yeah. idea is absurd. Now about the clean water. I mean, simply to take rainwater that when you redensify, when you densify a property, you fill up a block instead of a quarter of a block. Why not put that water down that falls on the roof into the aquifer by letting it percolate? Why not require that? That's a straightforward, simple solution. And, I, and I've been very aggressive in my water reuse uh, work. 
I would suggest it's pretty, pretty, pretty mandating as a new construction. Okay, we're at two or seven. I think I've been telling you before, and why don't we just uh, wrap it up there? Yeah, so um, I know at some point, uh, Governor Brown, just a little while ago, uh, was working on by rate zoning for uh, certain types of, uh, of, uh, of areas. Um, and I know that you know one of the big contributors to um, inflating the cost of construction and providing more housing in any given area is uncertainty and not knowing how long it's going to take to get your project fully in the title. Um, so I was wondering if there's been, uh, if that's just dead right now, or are you working on something down the pipeline to get buy rate zoning for in, in some form? Well, that's what we did. SB 35 is buy rate zoning. Um, so SB 35, we, it, it's, it's not, the governor's proposal was much broader. Um, and it had some strengths and it had some weaknesses to it. So SB 35, um, we, we basically started where the governor left off, uh, and we, and we, SB 35 is the fine rate. Good pass. Okay, everyone, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you.